is your relationship with money and how do you think about it? Is your relationship to money connected to a greater purpose or do you seem, simply see it as a means to satisfying material desires? And I mean, how do you even go about finding your purpose and why is it even important to be in pursuit of it? Well, these are some of the deep topics and questions we'll explore with uh, our guest today, Mar Michelle Hoistler. So Mar is the founder of the Give and Take Lab and the creator of the Inquiry Social Currency in Brazil. And after five years of working as a very successful financial trader in London and completing a master's in economics, she created the Me, Myself and Money methodology uh, which is applied to workshops, coachings, and an online course. And it's all with the purpose of exposing people to a new way of relating to money and connecting to their purpose. Additionally, she launched uh, a program called Time for Changers, which is a learning journey for Gen Zs with the purpose of inspiring people to take new actions in the world and birth their purpose projects. So Mara is a very interesting person because she has undergone a complete personal and spiritual growth journey as a result of her extensive traveling and the exploration she went on after quitting her job as a financial trader. One of the key goals with the work that she does today is to take the lessons she has gotten from traveling and her experiences in order to help others find a deeper purpose in life. You're listening to the Inventing the Future podcast, where we introduce you to the entrepreneurs and ideas that will inspire and empower you to solve the world's biggest problems. This is Julian Alvarez, and I'm a software engineer at Facebook and a Gen Z entrepreneur, where I'm currently the co-founder and CTO at a startup named Vice. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into the conversation with Mar. All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode. Um, I have a very special and unique guest with me today that has quite a, sh a journey to share. But uh, yeah, Mar, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian, for having me. Absolutely. Great to have you on. And I think to get started here, it would be great uh, to hear a bit about your story uh, and how you got interested in the world of finance and eventually why you ended up making this wild decision to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> sure. Um, where to start? So I think how I got interested in finance was that from a young age, um, money for me seemed freedom. Like it was like freedom and that was my ticket out. And finance at the time was the industry to be in. And it was like, you know, it was like the Wolf on Wall Street, right? You've seen the movies, you kind of know what it's like. Um, yeah. But then I had a big insight that, yeah, it wasn't really aligned with my values. I worked really hard to get there. I started as a um, salesperson. I became a trader very young at like 21 and kind of had the peak of my career at 25. And that's at 26 when I decided to leave. I had kind of reached all the goals I wanted to. I wanted to make this amount of money, be in this position. And I kind of thought, and now what? <laughs> And I realized it wasn't completely aligned with my values, but I also I wondered if there was more to life than just kind of getting to that position. You know what I mean? Like when you're young and you've kind of made it. And um, that kind of drove me on this path to leave finance, leave my career behind at such a young age. And let's say take the money I had in cash, not the deferred shares that were not given to me and travel the world. And that was like, okay, you know what? This is what I've always wanted to do. I also wanted to do a master's, which I did at that time at Schumacher College, traveling. Um, and then entrepreneurship kind of knocked on my door. It's always been a bit of a dream of mine. I think when I was young, I was like, you know, um, I'd love to have my own business, you know, as you would call it when you're a, a bit younger, let's say, per se, when I was um, starting out and being my own boss. And that's, of course, our own journey in itself, um, which I think we will address in our talk together. Um, but it's been really... I guess I could say wonderful in the sense of being a woman also and having just had a child, it has given me a lot of flexibility. Of course, mm -hmm. there's a lot more weight on my shoulders because, you know, um, I'm taking care of myself, right? But um, I can work from home. Um, I've really, like, you know, cut up my hours. Now the world is obviously shifted in such a different way, right, that... Um, that these possibilities are there and I'm just really loving it. And I think one thing to add is that entrepreneurship merged two paths for me. Something that was very important for me was like social change or, or social impact 
and um, and let's say the business world of finance into something that became meaningful and was, let's say, aligned with my values. So interesting, yeah. And um, you know what I find interesting about your story is that you at one point noticed that your values were misaligned, right? When you were working as a financial trader in London, but how, how did you realize that? Like how was, was that not evident from the beginning or did something happen for you to realize that your values were misaligned? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was so driven at the point to like profit maximize, you know, that I kind of like, how do I say? And like, blunt terms were not <laughs> swearing, but I didn't really care about anyone else. I was just there to make money, basically, and that's what my main goal was. But when I'd achieved that monetary goal or the thing I wanted, per se, I realized I wasn't happier, like something was missing inside. And um, it wasn't just about that goal or that outcome, right? Because I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't dishonest but I wasn't completely honest as well in making it right like I mean there's a way a fine line between you know being a good trader right and being able to you know get good prices and and give good prices and kind of make that market um and I think when I realized that a lot of my clients were starting to become really good friends of mine as well I started thinking like how can I be making this kind of money of people let's say per se in trading and and at the same time, the financial crisis happened of 2007 to 11, where, you know, Lehman Brothers went bust, AIG, um, all the Spanish, Portuguese, Irish banks. And I was a trader in the bank trading their bank debt. So I was trading Lehman Brothers when it was down to like zero point whatever AIG, right? But I realized as we were doing it, we were making millions and it was all like a massive drive. But on the back of that, people's lives were massively affected. Like people were committing suicide and like even worse, right? Losing their whole entire livelihoods on the back of this financial crisis. And I think that kind of shook me to realize, okay, so what are we doing? And we're making so much money, but, you know, it's at the cost of others, let's say, or at the cost of something. And I think that was something that, yeah, opened my eyes a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. When the empathy kicked in into like what the outcome or what the effect of uh, making that money was which like was hurting other people i probably brought in greater awareness and yeah, exactly one one thing i also want to highlight one of my favorite quotes by tony robbins is that he says that success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure and mm. i think about that often um so i'm sure that that might resonate with you on some level uh when you realize that financial success does not uh exactly equate to fulfillment totally i mean that that hits the nail on the you know hits it on the head basically yeah yeah amazing okay so then you went and you traveled around the world like what what did you discover were you in search of your purpose or did you find your purpose how did that journey go for you <laughs> yeah i was really in search of something else you know i i really left to like south america into the amazon like um you know, really trying different things, travels through the whole kind of continent. Then to India, I lived in ashrams and communities. I shaved my head. You know, I went to the full way out, right? Like really trying to search for like a deeper meaning in life, I think, or like, like you know, what is the purpose of all of this? Like, why are we living this? And and I think I, I just really realized that, um, I mean, this is boiled down to something very simple, but I don't believe we were born to, to work from nine to five or whatever we might call it to make money, to put food on the table and pay our rent. And that's it. Right. Like I inherently believe that each of us has a purpose in our lives, not saying that you have to have pressure to find your purpose because I, I don't want it to be another pressure. Right. But that it's a blossoming from within of what really means something to you. And, um, and I could definitely see that my purpose is much more the work I'm doing now. I, and I see that I can feel it because when I come out, I'm more energized than when I started. You know, when you go to work and you're like depleted at the end, it shows that like it's not really re-energizing. But I'm coming out and I'm like, yeah, this is it. This is really what I want to do. I'm loving this. This is making me feel great, you know. And of course, the tasks you don't want to do so much, right? Everyone has admin or something that isn't. And some people love it, but maybe it's not necessarily your, you know, most favorite thing to do. But yeah, there's... There's that element of like really feeling in your flow, let's say, and um, yeah, and aligning with that. 
And for me, I, I realized that working with people was one of them. And there's one thing I want to add to this before we kind of go on is that I don't think your purpose completely changes from what you've done in the past. I think it's an integration of your whole path, you know? So hmm. it's not like I was a trader and then I had nothing to do with that. You know, now I'm working with people around their relationship to money, understanding this. And so, so it comes from a root that's rooted in something in the past because it does shift into something. And that's how I've seen a lot of the people I work with and that kind of element transform. Yeah. And uh, it's really insightful. And what I've realized for myself is that regardless of how much clarity you have on your purpose, uh, it's a never ending process of discovering because you're always discovering a new part of yourself as you manifest more of your potential and you see what you're capable and you just learn and, and see more of the world. Uh, so there's that never ending cycle of, of discovery. Um, and then I've, I've also noticed for myself as well that determining what I like the most or what fulfills me the most is just a matter of being aware of what gives me the most energy or what takes away my energy. It's very exactly. energy dependent. Uh, so I try to be as aware of that, like, oh, I'm coding. How does this make me feel? Like, mm. does it give me energy or take energy? I'm working on this learning product or my startup or this podcast. Is it giving me or taking away energy? This specific person, are they giving me energy or taking away energy? And, and many times you realize you're friends with someone just because you've been friends with them in the past, but they're not really... Uh, giving you energy in a way that inspires and fulfills you. So mm. uh, I think it's a really good gauge of um, what works and what doesn't in that regard. Um, so, yeah. And I, I love how you integrate parts of your past to rediscover your present purpose. So uh, on the, on the topic of money, I'm also curious, like what, what is money to you and how would you define your relationship to it? I think in the past, it was something I really wanted to attain to, you know, it was like, okay, I wanted this amount of money, I thought that would make me happy. Um, and I got to that amount of money, but it didn't really change so much, right? <laughs> and um, I'm seeing money much more as a tool. And I think this is why it was invented too, right? Um, I've studied a few things behind it, but it was a, a form of exchange. It was to fa facilitate exchanges. It wasn't there as a store of value per se. And a lot of currencies have that, um, in the past, have that embedded, this demurrage, where it goes down in value the longer you store it, because it's actually something that was invented to allow the transactions to happen. And um, I'm much more seeing it like this. It's a bit like a, a pool of, like, what do you say, pool of stale water or something that doesn't move. You know, things start breeding in it, like mosquitoes or whatever. But when you when it's like a river and flowing, there's always money coming back in. And so I much more see myself and money and this relationship in terms of like plugging myself into the flow of that. And it's exactly what you're saying. If you're in, in the right energy, if it gives you energy, if you're in the right flow with it, money also comes. It's a consequence of the actions. It's not something... Of course, I'm not saying you, you're not going to do something for money, maybe but it's there, but it hasn't, it doesn't have to be a primary, primary instinct. And for example, with the women I'm coaching, one of them, she said, I went back to my old job because, because I was afraid, like not to have enough money. And she said, I did it for three weeks. And even though I was making that money again, she said, I was depleted. I realized that I didn't want that money. I preferred to have less of it, but more of my time. And and so I do feel like a lot of us, like you're saying, very sensitive to energy, but also can really tap into that and see, am I working for money or is money becoming a tool for me out of this, you know? Because when we start working for money, I don't know, maybe some people can go through it. My experience was that it was really tough for me and it didn't really bring me full happiness. And, um, and now I can see my relationship is much more fluid with it and I'm much more detached, let's say, and I trust that it comes and goes. I also think there's something very transactional about our society. It's like, I do this, so I should get that for it. And we've become very like, you know, versus just opening up a little bit and saying, okay, there's a wider flow in all of life, you know, that we can really tap into in one way or the other. And really trusting that, okay, if it doesn't work out here, you will find the next thing mm -hmm. that really aligns with you, you know, so. Definitely, yeah. Two, two things that that inspires for me. One is like there's, there's this really great quote that says that money doesn't necessarily change who you are. It just allows you to become more of who you are. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it's like a potential form of energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's a tool that you can potentiate. If you're a good person, you have more money to do good with. If you're a bad person, you have more money to do bad things with. Uh, so 
it, it kind of like is this potential energy that you can enact. And what you're saying there as well is that it's not necessarily that making money is good or bad, but what really matters is the intention you set behind it. Why do I want this money? Right. And if you want it like for material possessions that are serving some goal that is maybe not productive, then probably not a good thing. But if you're doing it to magnify your impact and to be able to grow yourself by investing in yourself and everything that you do, you know, that's, that's probably a better purpose. Um, I agree. And, yeah. And the final note I wanted to point out here is uh, that you highlighted is that money isn't uh, like I, I used to see money as the end goal, but now I see it as a, almost like a byproduct, as you're saying. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I build companies now for myself and when I see other companies that are really successful, it really is the companies that are mission driven. Mm -hmm. that ironically also tend to make the most money, right? Because they're not focused on making money. As a result, they're focused on creating the best products, serving their users to the highest degree. And a byproduct of doing those things and of serving that mission is that money will come. Uh, and I think it's the same for your career. As long as you're kind of aware of how you can maximize value and impact, money will come as a result of that. And and one one final thing I'll note here is that Peter Demandis has a great quote that I say repeatedly that the best way to become a billionaire is to solve a billion person problem. So that just kind of equates that the impact that you're able to have on others and the value you provide will equate to money, but you don't have to be so focused on it. It just comes as a byproduct of your value and contribution to the world. Yeah, I love that. I really love what you're bringing. And I just want to touch on one thing where you said on your last quote, right? It's, I see money as a neutral energy. And it's exactly this, if we project, you know, if we use it for greed or scarcity or fears or other things, that's what it's going to amplify. But if we use it for positive things, that's what it's going to amplify too. And it's going to amplify our relationship to it. That's what I've really learned. So if you are feeling, coming from a place of scarcity, that's what it amplifies back to you. It's like a mirror to us. So it's really almost using it as like a game, you know, and we can really engage with money and have a relationship with it in another way. <laughs> And I really encourage people to do that. You can even have a conversation with it and say, hey, you know, this has happened to me or this is how I feel around you, money. Let's personify you. Let's see what, you know, you can make out of that. So, <laughs> hmm. so fascinating. Um, a, a final point here uh, on the topic of money is how would you recommend, like what questions can people ask themselves to have a better relationship with money? How can, like what journey or what resource or what questions can people use to, to improve their relationship to money? Sure. Um, like, for example, I like to ask this question, if money didn't exist, what would you be doing with your time right now? Right? That's like, you know, it's like if money were no object, you know, how would you spend your day to day? And really tap into this and just see, okay, what would I be doing? And I'm not saying that that's what you're supposed to be doing the whole time, but it kind of brings us out of that rat race pattern, right? Or that fear mentality of what's driving us. It's, it's maybe a bit high level, but it really can kind of adjust things for you to really see, okay, is that important to me? Is that, you know, and really start um, boiling down to it. Yeah. 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 It's a great question. I ask myself that question often and, uh, I think if you want, once you get to the point where you answer that question of like, what would I do if money was not a problem and you're, you do the exact thing, same thing you're already doing. That's how, you know, you found your calling or what you need to do. Exactly. And you'd be doing it from your heart center. And I do believe at some point it will pay off because there's only, this is one thing I've seen also through the work. There's only one unique you. There's no other person who is exactly like you in the world who can offer what you're offering and so if you're not offering that the world is missing out and sometimes I even say it's super selfish that you're not doing it right because we're all missing out on your amazing gifts in there <laughs> yeah oh I love that I love that because um I think we just have like so much potential and energy and to limit the energy we give to the world because we're not in alignment to our purpose our calling our passions and everything else yeah, it's like you're by not serving the world, you're not serving yourself uh, at the same time, uh, just from an energetic standpoint. So beautiful way to put it. Uh, cool. So 
Mo- moving, I want to move on here to what you actually do with give and take, right? This is kind of like your startup and how you're taking it. But yeah, from a high level, what do you guys do uh, and why do you do what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually going through a little rebranding at the moment. Um, so mm-hmm. it won't stay with the same name, but basically how it was born is that um, I went on this whole spiritual journey and I realized that I'd picked up tools and I'd gone through, let's say, experiences that allowed me to find my purpose or where, where I got to now, but not everyone can do what I did. Not everyone can quit their jobs at 25. Not everyone can go on a massive long journey of years of traveling. Right. And, and do that. And so what I wanted to do was boil down all of these tools into something that people could do at home. You know, if you have a kid, if you have a job, if you're in a different situation, you can still manage to, to do that experience. And so I developed these workshops initially called me, myself and money, about your personal and emotional relationship to money. And I've done it with a few thousands of people around the world, given talks kind of really influenced that. But I realized I was working downstream because what I was working with was people who'd kind of like done a job burnt out and, you know, and were looking for like the next part of their lives. And I was like, why are we doing this? Like we need to go to the young people who, before they start those jobs, right? We need to go and tap in there and say like, hey, what is it you want to do? Alan Watts has this incredible video of like, exactly, if money didn't exist, what would you be doing? Why do we keep perpetuating this? And this is something really strong that called me to then set up another project um, called Time for Changers. And that's for young people, um, Gen Z, I would say, or well, more between the age of like 11 and 18 at the moment. That's what we're testing. But to really bring these, like, tools to them. So like financial literacy about, um, let's say regeneration and sustainability, mental health, me and the other, um, what is life purpose and all these different modules that are not really taught in school to kind of open firstly to, to let's say work, work hand in hand with the current education system, but also to open up your way of saying, okay, what is it your, what is your purpose project or what is it that you want to bring to the world? And let's make that possible. And so this is how kind of the whole structure of Give and Take Lab was born. And it's going through its own iterations, different parts of it. But yeah, in a gist, that's kind of what I'm aiming to do. And at some point, I have the inspiration to also um, be able to get into companies and really work with individuals there. Because I think the shift basically needs to happen on all levels. The individual, which is what I already do, I work one-to-one coaching, workshops, and then the school level, the community level, which is what I'm developing, and then also the broader level of like the company. So really this change happens on all levels, I feel. And so I want to bring these tools that have really helped my life into that. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, uh, spirituality as just a concept and a way of life, I think is incredibly powerful. And to bring that uh, more into the public, especially the younger generations that I think are the most distant from those sort of ideas, uh, I see a massive potential in that, uh, especially if you can make it practical, actionable, and easy to digest and understand. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I, I think in that regard, I'm, I'm curious like what you see as the problems that you're aiming to solve here. Like When you work with these people, these kids, what, what problems or challenges do you, they usually come at you with that you aim to solve through uh, the teaching and education that you give them? Yeah, sure. The, the three main pillars, I mean, the three pillars that we're working with is um, awareness, connection, and empowerment. And the awareness pillar is very much like giving awareness, like I said, about different topics, you know, really looking at it from another point of view. Um, the connection pillar is very much about connecting to yourself. So being able to feel the energies like you're saying or yourself, understanding, you know, how you're interacting with the world, what's important for you, but also connecting to a community of like-minded other young people. Mm -hmm. I feel that what's happened nowadays is that a lot of us are isolated in our own silos and might feel like we're the only one going through what we're going through. We're the only one maybe struggling with mental health right now, Mm -hmm. or we're the only one. And once we connect people in community, we realize that you're not the only one. And you, you might feel so alone with this dream about what you want to create in the world. But if you connected to someone else and shared it who was like-minded, that would amplify things, right? But instead, a lot of young people are sitting in there feeling a bit desperate about what's happening in the world and stuck in that, you know, belief. And then the empowerment pillar is very much like giving them the tools to empower them to take new actions. So it might, and it's not about taking, um, let's say, how do I say, it's not that everyone needs to start an entrepreneurial project. 
it's amazing. But not everyone's cut out for that, right? Some people might just decide to take new actions in the world, which might be like, okay, I'm going to stop eating meat on Mondays or I'm going to start recycling or whatever it is that might change the world per se, but also make you feel happier, right? So that's so individual. We're not um, prescribing like one action or one thing for each of them to do, let's say, but we're offering like, like saying, okay, open up and see what, what interests you, you know, what resonates with you. Let's all make a change. Like what can make you happier? You know, what, what action do you want to take? And that empowerment is a big one because, um, like, I mean, I haven't got the statistic right here right now, but we work a lot with this, like the mental health statistics are just massive for young people, um, going through depression, taking medication. Also the suicide rates have gone up massively since COVID, but also just everything that's happening. And it's a bit worrying to be honest. And I feel like, um, they're tools that we really ought to bring to the younger generations because it's also our responsibility in a way to empower them as they're the future leaders. So, yeah. I I really like that framework because the awareness piece is kind of like, okay, what are my opportunities for growth, right? In order Mm -hmm. to break a pattern, you have to be aware that it exists. Mm -hmm. The connection piece is kind of the both emotional and informational support that you have along the journey. Mm -hmm in order to be able to overcome whatever challenges come along mm-hmm. the way and to be able to relate with others. And it's also a piece of accountability in many ways. Mm-hmm. And then finally, the empowerment is how do you take that awareness and the support from your community to mm-hmm. actually inspire you and drive the action that is necessary to fulfill whatever goals you want to set for yourself. Exactly. So I, I really see how they work with each other in a very unique ways. Um, yeah. And so I'm curious from... Um, like, let's say you were working with uh, a young entrepreneur in this case. W- what do you think is one of the most valuable things that is important for them to understand or maybe one of the pillars they struggle with the most? And and uh, what's one piece of wisdom that you would give them as it relates to these pillars? I mean, the big thing I see even in adults, but I would say is like self-trust and self-value, like really believing in yourself and what you want to bring to the world. You know, like so many entrepreneurs have come with ideas and people are like, that's crazy, that's crazy, no way, you know, shutting you down. And it's hard, right? It's tough. Yeah. I feel like our society is not built to let kids dream or like young people, you know, like you, you're born and you, it's kind of like you're born and you know what your mission is when you're young. And then the world kind of closes you down. It's like, no, that's not possible. No, that's not possible, right? And at some point I'm just like, it is possible. And let's let everyone, let's let us dream again. Let us get into you know get that awareness connect to ourselves and others and get empowered to make that happen you know because you know that trust no one can take away from you that self-trust that your value within no one can touch and if you know if you're in the right place if you are standing in your purest integrity and know what you're connected to go from there yeah, I've I've realized from talking to many guests that many times it's not really that you need to be extraordinarily gifted or talented or whatever. Many times what makes a difference is being extraordinary in the way that you think and the con- conviction and self-belief, self-efficacy that you have for yourself. Uh, it's crazy the difference that that makes because your beliefs are almost in complete alignment to your actions. So just by believing that something is possible and not letting the bullshit narratives either from yourself or from others tear you down that's literally what gives you the space to actually take the action to push in the direction of those dreams love it you've got it exactly there powerful uh so when when uh the last things i want to highlight here or ask about is you talked about these purpose projects what is what does this look like like how would you recommend that the average person or the young entrepreneur how can they go about do finding their purpose is it i know there's many ways to go about it you you primarily did it through traveling but is that what you would recommend the most or there other practical things or questions you would recommend to help people discover the purpose yeah i think one thing that's quite interesting and um there's a book in that called the hero's journey by joseph campbell and it was rewritten as a heroine's journey for women the journey of you know how to really empower yourself and find wholeness and what I think is very interesting in that whole journey, it's a bit different for women, but let's say for the men, it's like leaving your village, leaving your tribe, you know, to get out there and then to come back and bring that. And I think 
it can be done through travel, but other ways, maybe studying somewhere else. But sometimes we need to leave the conditioning we've been brought up in. Because that's also what we need to break free from to then allow that purpose to shine, let's say. And um, yeah, it's really inspired me. It's inspired my journey. There's a lot of work around this, you know, like walking those steps. And I, like I said before, I believe that our purpose is ingrained from us when we were young and when we were born. And it's connecting back to that essence inside of you. <coughs> Sorry. No worries. Mm. Sorry. Um, yeah, connecting back to the essence inside of you. And um, there are a few questions I like to ask as well. I have this, um, let's say, the purpose circle or something, but it's very much like, you know, firstly, what are your tools you know what have you come here what are your tools what are you good at you know what have you learned in your life what can you put to you know to practice also what are your successes what have you already and I'm not talking about only outside successes of like okay I've achieved this but you know what have you succeeded in in life and what has been important to you and and yeah what milestones have you gone through and then an important one is also what lessons you've learned because normally through the lessons we can even see what we're better in or stronger in to give to life. And, um, God, I read a quote yesterday or something. It was, it was saying something like all successful people or something, you know, have had a rough past in a way or something like this, you know? And, and yeah. sometimes we try and kind of cover that up or feel ashamed by it. But I'm like, hey, bring it out, you know, like rally for that. You've gone through this. You've succeeded. You've lived through this. You know, and it's not always easy. Some people come from different backgrounds, have gone through different situations. But when we can embrace all of these and put them together, we can really find something that shines a light for us. Um, and then the cherry on the cake is, of course, what brings you joy. And I think that is key to ask ourselves every day. Am I happy in what I'm doing? You know, am I doing this for a higher purpose? Am I really, you know, shining through it? So, yeah, I think... Uh... The, the key there is just asking why for like, why do I feel this way? Or why do I like this? Why don't I like this for like almost everything that you do? It, it, the key there, I think, is the, that level of introspection. But it's a great point to also realize that it's not just for new experiences, but it's also like you have this whole knowledge base of your past that you can dive into at any point. And even for the most difficult things that have happened, those are uh, those often have the most revealing answers uh, for that describe or tell you who you are and what passions or purpose may exist within you. So uh, some good digging there to do uh, for, for people. Um, cool. So I, I want to move into one spirituality question I want to ask, um, just because I think you live, you, you live in this balance. I've noticed not only for yourself, but I notice it in myself as well between both the spiritual and the physical world. So, I'm curious how you think about the duality between both of these worlds and how you kind of balance like, oh, should I be doing, 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 executing, or should I just be being like, there, there seems to be a core balance between these two extremes. And I'm curious how you think about it and balance it for yourself. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good one to tap upon. I can definitely tell you that when I worked as a trader, I was do, 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 right? <laughs> like literally, <laughs> yeah. and it was from morning to night and two Red Bulls. That was the first thing I drank in the morning. I went out there and I was a machine, a machine, right? Like you would say, but then <laughs> I left and I went on the other side of the extreme. I was spending time in medita in in ashram, just meditating and just being and, and like having to cut all that away. And I mm -hmm. think like you're saying that, I think almost the purpose or the my the art of it is to balance the two in being and doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel that's what it's about. Like you do a little because I think we need to engage with life, but we also need to give the space to it. And I think it's something I brought in a few talks, but you might have heard, but it's about the flower, right? We plant the seed, we do it, we plant it, but then we water it, we do some stuff, but we give it the space also to grow. Mm, and that. and that space sometimes is missing in our lives right that that's the beingness of like okay giving that space allow it to come of its right mm. time and the fruits will come right the flower will blossom and i think that is the importance with it it's very much like in esoteric terms as i would say it's a masculine and the feminine aspect and it's not male and female right but it's a masculine and feminine. the healthy masculine is really present space holding you know doing but and the feminine is receptivity abundance um 
sensitivity, awareness, like, you know, the, so when these two are in sync, like the yin and yang sign, if you know it from Chinese, right, it's a perfect right. mix. I think that's what we're striving. And that's the same between the spiritual and the material. I think they need to be together. I spent years looking for something in the material world. I went on the other direction, trying to chase that spiritual experience or, or you know, meditating and stuff. But that didn't bring me anything either. And it's very much being rooted. I love that image of like being a tree, right? Open to the heavens above or the sky above or whatever you want to call it, the universe or receiving the energy, but being rooted with deep roots into the earth. And that's the material as well, really bringing it down because we can be spiritual, but if we can't live in the material world, there's a disconnect because we are part of this material world, no matter how spiritual we think we are. And I'm telling you, when I left finance, I had this little amount of money it allowed me to travel for 10 years. I was young and I was like, ah, I'm just going to do whatever course I want. I don't want anything to do with money, but I still had to live in the material world. Of course, I'd made the money before, but when reality hit me back, it's like at some point, you know, we need to balance those. And I don't believe that living off the system is the right way. You are not spiritually chosen that you are the one who's living off other people working. No, it's a self-responsibility for us to find that balance, right? To find our integrity in this and, and to really make that work. And so... For me, it's, I have my own practice. I'm not saying everyone needs to have the same practice, but I, I really believe in like something that brings you in alignment. So for example, I do sports every morning, yoga, I go for a run or walk, um, and I meditate. The first thing I do is I meditate in the morning, I breathe, you know, I connect to myself and many people have different ways, but it brings me into alignment before I start the day, you know, because yes, I am engaging with the material world, but and there's so many tools out there um, that you can really tap into and see what resonates for you. Because I don't think there's one, it's not a cookie cutter, right? One thing fits all. That's why we have so many different ones. But what speaks to you? I know some women who love to dance in the morning every day. I know other men who run, you know, who listen to a podcast. They read some inspiring quotes in the morning that get them going, you know. So it's really, one thing I've noticed, it's really about finding a routine in the morning that gets you going, that really works for you. Mm. And I think that's, Something that is almost key, I would say. I ran away from routine structure, but I realized that even without that, like just all oh, floating around, not knowing what day of the week it was, it was great, but you can't really get so much done as well, right? So it's like when we look at in, in the Indian mythology, they talk about Shiva and Shakti, and Shiva is the holding force, and Shakti is the energy that makes it happen, and that's exactly it. It's having the structure and then having the energy to flow through it that really makes it, like executes it, let's say. Mm. Yeah, there's this other great analogy I like a lot where it's like the, an iron flower where basically you're hard on your discipline and you work hard, but you're also soft on yourself. Mm. Uh, so I, I do find that, uh, and I love the analogy with the plant, by the way, right? Just like giving it, helping it, doing, promoting the growth, but also giving the space. And it's also like going to the gym, like building muscle. It's like, yeah, you need to go to the gym, but recovery is one of the most important parts of muscle growth. Uh, exactly. So I, I've, I've noticed that there's like these two extremes with almost anything and the ideal is somewhere in between. And what makes it so difficult is that the balance between the two extremes is very personal and you have to go on your own journey to discover what that ideal balance is. Uh, but like, that's that's part of like the journey of growth and spirituality for all of us that we need to go on and the best way to find uh what that ideal balance is i think is just to question how you feel as you're going like on one end versus the other end right like how you mm. felt as a financial trader in your case and how you felt like uh traveling and meditating like uh to an extreme and then just calibrating all over over time to find what works best mm. so that, that's one thing. The second thing I want to highlight as well is that uh, this really good quote, very simple, but it says that we're human beings, not human doings. So exactly. we're always doing, then we're not really being at the core of who we are and what we are. Um, and finally, the, the third thing I want to highlight here is that uh, similar to your analogy, I think a lot of between like execution and the convergent mind and like just the free flowing divergent mind i think about it as like walking versus running right you have a certain goal a certain destination and you want to run towards it because you want to get there as fast as possible but when you're running you don't really get to see what's around you you don't get to see the flowers and you also don't get to see alternative paths that might exist uh when you 
when you walk, you're able to question like, wait, why am I on this path? Is this the right path? Wow, look, there's another path that's potentially even better that I would not have noticed if I didn't take the time to reflect and walk and see. So I think we need to recognize that there is no one extreme that is dominant, but rather a balance and finding that balance is what you need to uniquely do for yourself uh, in order to live your best life. So, yeah. Love it. Um, <laughs> well, with that, uh, I want to ask uh, what, two or three more questions before we close off here, Marm. Uh, one of them is on mindset. I'm, I'm very curious from your perspective, how you think about success. Like, what does it mean to you? How do you measure it? What does success look like for you? Hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> I think everyone needs to determine it for themselves, right? Um, I remember really striving for out of material success and different things. And I came out of like a really deep ceremony and a reflection. And I realized that success meant for me really being the best version of myself in every moment. And through that, really getting to what I wanted to achieve, which was joy and happiness and bringing that to others through my work or through any moment I was in. And I, it came so clearly. It was like, if I'm the best mother in that moment, you know, if I'm the most centered, you know, leader for others in that moment, that's a success to me because you're being an inspiration to the others. Mm. And, and to that success, I also think, yeah, more things come. But I, that really... You no, know, before I had success as numbers, as goals, as things, and I wanted to achieve that and get there. But it's always going to be moving, right? When you have that goal, once you get that thing, I'm not saying it's wrong, but there's always the next thing to get to, right? There's always, and there's always going to be the bigger house, the better car, materially, the, you know, the next adventure, the next experience, the bigger experience. It's always going to be there. We're living in a world that's like a playground that we can continually, you know, bathe in and, and live that in but I realized that success is really living that moment being in that moment that the best version of myself and living that fully mm. and so I don't know that it's measurable per se <laughs> um <laughs> you know maybe it's too airy for some I don't know I do obviously still have like my to-do list and things I would like to get done and you know um but it's it's having those goals and letting like a bit like you said, letting go of the path, like letting go of the how, you know, of the that running and maybe walking or, or enjoying the, each step and breathing as you're as you're walking along there. And I think for me, success has become much more this um, living with integrity and being centered around that. Of course, yeah. to say I still want all the projects I'm working on to succeed, right, or to reach as many people as possible, um, you know, to really have an impact in that sense, but I don't want to do that from a place of burnout. I don't want to do that from a place of, you know, that's why I'm talking about the centeredness again and being, you know, in each moment, because yes, you can reach 10 people and then 20 people and then millions of people and then da, 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 right. Oh, I'm going to be more successful on that. But it, I think at the end of the day, we leave this world with ourselves and what we've gone through in ourselves. And that's all that we take with us. And so I think there is a sense of coming back to that in every moment. Yeah. I, I love that measure of success or how you think about it because it's more deeply rooted in, in emotional states and how you feel and in being present. And yes, you still have your projects. You're still doing your work. You're still like helping people. But it's rather that like if you have that, uh, those emotions as your core end in the success metric, on how you feel on the day to day and being present. Well, there's many different ways to fulfill that. And your work is one of the ways that enables you to do that. But I think it becomes dangerous if you say like, oh, money or a good house or a car, all, all those are kind of like the metrics of success because then, uh, you know, they're almost like attainable. And then there's a question of what comes after that. So I think for myself as well, I try to think of success in, as an infinite pursuit because it's more of like rooted in a journey rather than the destination. And exactly. I think that's what makes it sustainable. You, you just continually feel success by the way in which you're manifesting your life in every present moment, rather than some achievable, attainable thing that 
once you achieve almost becomes like withers away um, exactly so. I completely I think you put it into different words but it's exactly the essence I'm trying to get to so thank you yeah yeah absolutely I love that uh cool two more quick questions um I'm curious you know since you've had like quite a quite a journey in your professional life and then as an entrepreneur uh, what I mean, what has being an entrepreneur for yourself, both in the glorifying and agonizing moments, what has that taught you about life and the way that you live day to day? Wow, I love I love this question. I mean, it's not easy being an entrepreneur, hey? Like, <laughs> you yeah. know, I feel like there's accountability to ourselves. Um, what pops into my mind is something really. Yeah, maybe I'll share this analogy a little bit. But you know, when we're born, we have our parents and then we kind of look up to them and then we go to school and we've got our teachers and they're going to grade us and tell us how good we are. And, you know, and then we go into corporations and we have a boss and, you know, we get valued by, you know, the year end reviews and how much we're getting paid and, you know, all of that. And we go through that kind of system. Right. And I feel like when we graduated from that and realized we don't need to be valued from the outside, we're able to go on our own entrepreneurial journey and take self-responsibility and, and that for ourselves and stand on our own two feet and say, this is my idea, I'm going to make it happen, you know? And I think that takes a lot of courage in itself to step out and say, hey, you know, I'm going to stand up with that and I'm going to, you know, shine that light and be that. And I think that's something I've really learned in this journey because it's self-accountability. Of course, there's some days I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do that maybe, you know? I, but I'm only accountable to myself, you know, I can't like, it, there's such a, a drive and accountability that you need where it's not like a boss or someone grading you or directing you and telling you that that's your path. You know what I mean? And I find that really beautiful in, in the process of evolution of, of a human, of someone to, to get to that point. I'm not saying everyone's supposed to get to that point in one way or the other, but for the true entrepreneur who goes through these journeys and says, okay, you know, like, you know, grab the horn by its bulls and let's go for it, you know? <laughs> and I feel yeah. like you're cut out of the same thing, constantly wanting to evolve, you know, knowing yourself better. And I think the entrepreneurial journey really gives you that, right? It pushes you. Okay, I've done this. Okay, that's a failure. I think failure is not the right word. It's more like I've learned from that. Okay, how do we move on? How do I get up again? I look at my son. He learned how to walk. How many times he fell over flat out on his face, you know, and um, that's part of it, right? He got up and he did it again and he did it again and he did it again. But we think we need to be perfect in that moment. Yeah. You know, I love one that. shot on. Yeah. And so. It reminds me of this quote that one of my previous guests said, where he said that entrepreneurship is a personal development engine disguised as a business endeavor. Um, mm. and then that obviously just trickles into your, your everyday life. Exactly. Um, and I completely see that. I feel that like your work, your life, everything mirrors each other. So if you're, that's mm. exactly what you're saying. You know, your entrepreneurship journey is that as well. It's a mirror to you. It is. Yeah. <coughs> Same way money can be, uh, cool. So as, as a final question for you, Mar, um, I'm curious, what impact do you want to have in the invention of the future? How will you invent the future? I love it. Um, God, I mean, through everything I'm doing, what, what I feel like I would love to give is, is repackaging all this knowledge I've, you know, got to experience traveling, you know, living and allowing as many people who can and who want to, you know, learn from this and to really find a path through that. I really believe that empowering the younger generations is a huge key in that. And also I do a lot of work around with women, you know, really bringing that feminine back and having more women's voices heard. And I feel a future with young people and women's voices rising as well as everything else coupled would be an amazing future for our world. And yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you for inspiring that vision of the future and for the focus on the younger generations. Uh, and help them be a little less lost. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great contribution. Uh, cool. And, and where can people find you, learn more about you and what you're working on? So I have my Instagram, Mar Michelle Heusler. I also have the website givetakelab.com. 
um, we're going through kind of a shift at the moment, but it's there. And I can send you the links as well if you want. And Great. You can, like, that would be awesome. Them out. Time for Changers. It's currently only in Portuguese because we're starting in Portugal, but hopefully in the next phase we'll be rolling out and it'll be much more accessible. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's super exciting. Um, well, yeah, with that, I'm, I'm uh, very grateful to have had you on the, on the show, Mar. Uh, I appreciate your energy, your wisdom. Uh, and the connection of your soul. And yeah, I very much look forward to see how you'll take things and evolve things and transmit all the wisdom you have into uh, all the ways that you can help um, people through your work. So thanks for coming on. It was super fun. Thanks so much for having me. And um, it was a real pleasure to speak to you. Absolutely. So thanks for listening, everyone. Um, stay infinite and be infinite as always. And we'll catch you on the next episode.